So in week three, um, the uh, I uh, discussed the museum itself, uh, and um, did you actually uh, visit the museum for your descriptions? Yes, yes, of course, um, and particularly the Gallery of Mineralogy. This, yeah. this amazing building that was actually maybe. 2016 2015 is reopened mm -hmm. and they had kind of redone it and reopened to the public oh, okay. so for those of your listeners who are able to get there it's it's yeah. really amazing for me it, it's like it brings me back to being a little boy i mean of course the you know the dinosaur bones and the you know woolly mammoth and stuff in the main museum is yeah. also so yeah. evocative but yeah there's something about walking through and seeing you know, it's also kind of from the era of colonialism, too. It's like this era mm -hmm. of like when Western Europe was taking all these resources from around the world. And so there's yeah. something a little dark about it. But it's also like this example of all the wealth of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a sapphire from Louis the Fourteenth. There's all this golden um these minerals from colorado and from south america in there yeah. and they put these incredible lights on them so they're all like flickering and flashing yeah. and you just have this sense of like the world's wealth being concentrated yeah. in one literally place. right because it's all literally. from the earth yes exactly yeah. and uh it's you know you can't walk through there and not think you know what did they do with all this stuff yeah. during the second world war and yeah uh, so really the first time walking through there, I started to think, you know, what what could I come up with that's small and portable, that's exceptionally yeah. valuable? Yeah. You know, because you think about across town at the Louvre, there's, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're moving the Mona Lisa. The whole Louvre yeah. right before the German invasion becomes like this packing yard. There's these really evocative photographs of the halls of the Louvre. They, they look like, you know, there's like straw and crates everywhere and there's yeah. uh, ghosts of you know Rembrandt's yeah, where they're yeah. taken off the walls mm -hmm. and so you you really think you know what what is it like to think you know to first in your mind you don't want to believe the invasion's coming so you wait mm -hmm. too long maybe yeah. there's a coronavirus comparison there mm -hmm. too yeah and then to think you know what am i what are we going to do with all these things how do yeah. we protect all these cultural yeah. treasures these mineral treasures from this invading army it's a fascinating and sad predicament yeah Okay, so that was really the spark for you when you walked through the gallery? Yeah, that was the spark. I knew I wanted her to grow up in the museum, and I knew yeah. I wanted this this intertextuality of having 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea yeah. as part of yeah. it. And, uh, of course, there is a little bit about the museum in the beginning of that mm -hmm. book. Um, so I knew I wanted to somehow play with that. There's also some apiaries in the gardens yeah. around the museum, yeah. too. and. So it just felt like it was all starting to kind of come together. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of a fantasy. What would it be like to grow up in the Natural History Museum mm. and, you know, have your father yeah. be there? And then nowadays you see all these people walking around with key cards. You know, everything's locked and it's hard to get in all these rooms. Yeah. And they have these yeah. fancy little electronic cards. But I just started to imagine and research, you know, how did they lock things before? And it turns out, you know, there actually was yeah. a person in charge of the keys. And, yeah, yeah. Yo, know, that's like a taxi driver's brain. How do you control, how do you manage all these keys and locks and organize that in your mind? It's fascinating to me. Amazing.